Hello, uh, happy Friday. Good evening, everyone. My name is Spencer Rakti. I'm the author events manager here at Third Place Books uh, in Seattle, Washington. Um, I am so pleased uh, to welcome you to tonight's conversation with Anne Elizabeth Moore um, and Matilda Bernstein Sycamore. They are both here to discuss Anne's new memoir, Gentrifier, which is out now from Catapult Books. Uh, first of all, I invite all of you to uh, say hello in the chat window at the bottom of your screen and tell us where you're zooming in from. Um, and second, uh, I want to say that through virtual events like tonight's, uh, Third Place Books is very fortunate to continue connecting readers with authors in an intimate setting. Uh, we do sorely miss having authors in our store, but at the same time, we're so grateful to have this new platform that brings authors into your homes all across the world. Um, thank you again for tuning in tonight and for supporting independent bookstores. As I mentioned before, the chat window at the bottom of your screen is open and we encourage you to use it respectfully. Uh, tonight, we will also have some time for your questions. So if you have questions for our, either of our authors this evening, um, please feel free to submit those in the Q&A window below at the bottom of your screen, which is separate from the chat window. Um, we also offer closed captioning for those who are interested. Uh, just hit the live transcript button at the bottom of your window to turn this feature on or off. And finally, as you may have experienced during virtual gatherings, uh, technical issues may arise, and if they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. Uh, so thank you for your patience and understanding, but overall, thank you uh, to all of you for sticking around um, during this virtual era. It's really strictly because of you that this author series is even possible. And now let's introduce tonight's speakers. Anne Elizabeth Moore is an Eisner Award-winning author for her scholar, uh, scholarly work on cartoonist Julie Doucette, as well as the author of the critically acclaimed nonfiction book, Body Horror, Capitalism, Fear, Misogyny, Jokes, which was nominated for a Lambda Literary Award and was a Chicago Public Library Best Book of 2017. Moore is the former editor of the award-winning Punk Planet, the founding editor of Best American Comics, and is the former editor-in-chief of the Chicago Reader. Anne is joined in conversation tonight by Matilda Bernstein Sycamore, the author most recently of The Freezer Door, which was a New York Times editor's choice, one of Oprah Magazine's best LGBTQ books of 2020, and a finalist for the ben, uh, Penn Jean Stein Book Award. Her previous nonfiction book, The End of San Francisco, won a Lambda Literary Award, and her novel Sketch to See was one of NPR's best books of 2018. Her new anthology, Between Certain Death and a Possible Future, Queer Writing on Growing Up with the AIDS Crisis, is out now and is also available from Third Place Books. The book tonight is Gentrifier, uh, Anne's memoir of art, gender, work, and survival that I can't wait for us to get into tonight. NPR writes that Gentrifier is an investigation of the costs, monetary, psychological, ethical, of a free house and an ode to the neighbors who gave her life their inflections of joy. In a review in Orion Magazine says that Moore holds the serious alongside the hilarious and the clarity and intelligence of her, pro intelligence of her prose illuminates both. And with that, I can't wait to join in watching this conversation with all of you tonight. Uh, Anne is going to start us off by reading a few passages from Gentrifier. So Anne, welcome. The virtual stage is yours. Spencer, thank you so much for that delightful introduction. I'm going to read a couple passages from this book here, Gentrifier, a memoir. As I stumble toward adulthood, I seek solace in punk clubs where I drink endless cheap beers out of cans with people who bathe rarely, wear leather, and have relationships with their parents as fraught as my own. This is where I first hear the phrase, property is theft, a translation of French anarchist Pierre-Joseph Proudhon's pronouncement of a tuperative argument against landowners who profit from renting out farmland and housing stock. Most often I hear it when someone grabs a beer that I protest is mine. Property is theft, some black clad punk will say as he downs it. There is a house on my side of the street about six lots south with an overgrown front yard, barely standing chain link fence, broken front windows, a hole in the roof, blue paint, formerly vibrant, has peeled from the face of the structure to reveal raw, rotting wood. However, mail is delivered there every day. According to city bylaws, the building is blighted. 
The grass, which comes up to my chin, is taller than the allowable four inches. The unrestricted access posed by the broken front windows meets the city's vague definition of a building that is an attraction to trespassers. And the hole in the roof grows after each storm, so the structure would appear to present a danger to anyone who enters the facility. When I ask the neighbor girls about it, the six-year-old across the street chirpily explains that it is the half-witch house. Someone lives there, I attempt to clarify. The half-witch, she says sternly, as if I have not been paying attention. But what is a half-witch, I ask. Anne, if she were a full witch, she would fix her roof, the six-year-old says. A faraway friend has purchased tickets to the symphony for my birthday. So one day in the spring, a local pal and I get dressed up and meet at an outdoor cafe before the concert. The neighborhood, Cass Corridor, can be described as rapidly developing, rapidly gentrifying, or rapidly deteriorating, depending on who is speaking. During our meal, a woman walks by and begins muttering loudly to her friend about how she has lived in the neighborhood for years and is appalled by recent changes. She gesticulates performatively toward the restaurant. A young white woman, a cafe patron, seated with several other young white women a few tables away from us, laughs rudely at her performance. The woman from the neighborhood, older and black, becomes enraged. The host of the establishment, a burly man, emerges, and the neighborhood woman speaks to him in an angered but reasonable tone. You act white, she says, but I know your mama. How are you okay making money from all this? The host tells her to leave. Instead, she puts the question to him again, louder. This time he shoves her hard and she stumbles and falls backward into the street. When she gets up, he punches her in the face. Well, thank you so much for that reading, Anne. Um, that part of the book actually, I feel like is one of the parts that moved me the most. Um, and it's, I feel like you have this tactic in the book where you show these really complicated, visceral, um, emotionally intense, uh, charged interactions, and then you just leave the reader, boom. Like you don't comment on it necessarily. Um, you don't even necessarily show your emotional response. So the response is all ours, right? So we're stuck there to figure out how to deal with it. Um, and I feel like there's a kind of honesty to that um, and also a sense of making the reader accountable, you know, with what is taking place um, and allowing that reaction um, to exist perhaps with yours, but also perhaps separately. Um, yeah. And I, I wondered if you wanted to talk about that sort of tactic, both the tactic of bluntness, the tactic of stepping back, and the tactic of perhaps pulling back the emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that is an excellently phrased question, Matilda. And I, there, so there's a couple things that are going on there. And one of them is that part of the, the structure of the book is about trying to, um, without damaging the reader. I love my readers and I love readers in general. And so I don't want to hurt them, but I do want to be able to replicate trauma as closely as possible to convey it accurately. And so I feel like one of the things about this book was that it allowed me to imagine a scenario in which I could just present the facts as I experienced them, as I saw them, and really, as you say, kind of pull back from presenting my own emotional um, structure to it. I think probably anybody who is familiar with my work or me in any way knows that I'm actually not um, emotionless or um, even like, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a total uh, freak about stuff. I will absolutely like freak out in the moment. And when that happened in the restaurant, I lost my shit and just started like kind of screaming at everyone around, you know. And being able though to write about that moment cleanly allowed me to see it differently and allowed it to be presented to the reader differently. But I do wanna 
suggest that the way that I set up um, sort of an emotional trajectory is by, is the way that I structure those bits of information. And so as those different vignettes or um, chunks of text are sort of, um, the, the way that they sit in the book is intended to guide the reader along a certain emotional pathway. And so I don't, like it's not entirely accurate that I'm withholding um, my own emotional trajectory from it, but I am, but I'm trying to let the reader develop their own responses while still offering some kind of narrative through the larger story that I'm trying to set up, which is not so much about individuals, as Daphne says in the chat, um, often men punching women, but about how that reflects the violence that happens on a day-to-day -day basis in Detroit and in all sorts of places where gentrification happens. Yeah, and I, that's, yeah, I also, I want to hear a little more about how you develop that structure because I, I love hearing your, this other aspect, right, of losing it, right? Losing it in the cafe. And so I imagine that that is something you originally wrote, right? And I mean, I'm just asking as a question, yeah. but, but I want to know, because I feel like the book as a whole is structured in these vignettes, right? And they each are in some ways autonomous, um, and at the same time, they connect with one another. And um, like you just said, they show the structure of trauma. Um, by, and in another reading, you said you keep it in present tense because present tense is how trauma exists, right? And, but I, I'm curious to hear, you know, maybe first about that editing process, like how you were able to take everything that you experienced experience and then pare it down and maybe start with this this one part because I'm really fascinated by that yeah well interestingly enough I mean most of my writing even as a journalist tends to be emotionally driven and the the style and the tone and the the sort of oomph of it is always about um trying to get to the rage that either exists in the situation that I'm describing or that exists in me as I'm thinking about the situation I'm describing. But for whatever reason, when I started writing these vignettes, which originally um, I didn't know what I was going to do with them, I just started jotting these little notes. Uh, and the first time that I put them together, I sort of organized them into some kind of structure, not really having any idea um, where they were going. I I put a zine together, um, which, I mean, Matilda and I know each other from the independent publishing world for going back quite a while, decade, it took a couple decades probably. And, um, and I just, and they were all funny. They were all comedy driven. And um, I, I just thought like, oh, maybe I can, maybe I can basically just make a joke book about like, what is it like to win a free house? Like, here's a bunch of funny stuff. But I um, made a couple copies and I gave them to friends and I just, you know, got a handle on what people were thinking. And someone gave their copy to their mom and their mom um, found it really distressing emotionally. And I was told, you know, started kind of crying right away. And I was like, oh, wait, I can actually use that juxtaposition and build out a larger structure of these vignettes and actually tell a more accurate version of what it is like to live in this city that is going through enormous change and has just done so much damage to so many people for so long. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, oh, I want to encourage people also, anyone who's uh, watching, feel free to if you have any questions, just throw them in the Q&A at any point. Feel free to continue the chat. We love seeing you here and hearing your feedback. So any questions you have at any point, we'll get to them um, at the end. So, you know, don't hold back. Um, and so I think that's an interesting dynamic too, that dynamic between humor and um, seriousness, which I think also plays out between journalism and personal experience. 
and between witnessing and um, I guess going through, right? Or like uh, witnessing and feeling everything, right? Yeah. And, and so I wonder, so that's, and I love that it started with this zine, right? And that the humor struck someone else as devastating, right? And that's, I think, always true of any writing. Like one thing that we find humorous, someone else might lose it. And something that we find completely devastating might be humorous to someone else, right? And that in some ways is, is the power of humor. And I know you've done a lot of work with comics in particular. And I wonder if, um, if that, is that part of what made you decide to keep this book text only and not include visual aspects? Or what was that aspect? What was that decision like? Yeah, I think that when I, when I decided that, I mean, so a number of, a number of things. As the story unfolded and, and the, the writing that I first did um, some of which appeared in that zine um, that I gave to friends. That writing, uh, I, I started taking notes on it and I started drafting it well before the drama that unfolds in the book actually happened. So that was like, even before I knew there was a story to tell. And just for... Um, people who are out there who haven't read the book or people who um, don't know the story or don't follow me on Twitter and know uh, how this played out. But I was given a house in 2016 by an organization in, in Detroit that promised to give free houses away to writers. And the house that I received turned out to not be free. Um, in fact, it was quite expensive and it belonged to someone else. And the sort of unfolding of that drama of how it was revealed that my house was, you know, definitely not mine. Definitely there was a, a crime at the center of it and I don't wanna to give too much away, but um, you know, someone was really, really hurt in my house. Um, not, this is not murder. Murder is a different, <laughs> I'll write a murder story later. Um, but, but, the city had enacted very serious violence on, on, on this woman and it continues to act, enact a lot of violence on a lot of women uh, that live in Detroit. And, um, you know, that was devastating. And that was the moment that I was like, okay, I have to write a book about this. But I wanted to write a journalistic piece. I wanted to actually talk to that woman, have her tell her story and do it in a like, you know, potentially more ethical way, right? Like not just like tell the tendrils of her story that I could pick up, but actually like give her the honor of letting the facts speak for themselves. And no publications would take it. Nobody wanted to hear that story. Nobody wanted to hear more about Detroit. Nobody wanted to hear this horrible um, drama. Um, and Ugh, what they do want to hear is a memoir. And so I decided to try to tell a bunch of these conflicting stories in one narrative that would sort of tell my story, but also tell the story of my neighborhood and also the story of this house and the story of this organization and the story of the city. Um, so it became a lot of different things. And then it was sort of easy to have these little vignettes that were like interchangeable and sort of shifted, but but then the, the way that they unfold ends up telling a larger story, which of course is a, the trick that I picked up from comics. The way that the images appear, the order in which they are uh, placed on a page, that tells a story that is different regardless of how you are structuring it. Yeah, and some of the structural issues that you're talking about in Detroit, like you have, um, you know, you have these statistics that come up, you know, every now and then that are just like devastating, just statistics, uh, you know, like the statistic of um, that a quarter of homeowners in Detroit are facing foreclosure because they can't afford property taxes, for example. So that's sometimes like $300 that they owe and they lose their house because of that and how that is used in a very 
purposeful way to, um, you know, in a majority black city to take away generational wealth. And also at the same time, I think you show really well the way that this is the how the city is making money, right? So it's like a double sword, you know, it's like, first of all, taking away black wealth from poor people, more or less, poor working class or middle class people who are barely holding on. Um, and then turning those, flipping those houses, right? And like, so it's like benefiting from the blight that they claim to be correcting, right? The blight is there, you know, a, is a result of the city's actions. And then the city makes money off of that. And then talks about this blight in order to continue criminalizing the people, you know, in the neighborhoods. And I think, uh, and you talk about that toll, you know, I think in another part, you talk about how almost 50% of people in Detroit are functionally illiterate. Um, and that's that same story, right? It's because the schools have been defunded, you know, it's because people don't have access to basic needs that the city should be providing. And I think these pieces are just interspersed again, like in these very small compacted ways, but at the same time, it really does build this through line, you know, throughout, um, throughout the book. And also, it, you know, it is, it is devastating, like that emotional impact. And I think another thing you do really well is to show through what you were just talking about, you know, the so-called free house, um, and you moving into this majority Bangladeshi neighborhood in Detroit, um, and and the neighbors welcoming you really because they they want people in these houses so that it doesn't become this city created you know blight that then um, that that cycle right so that they can hope to stop that cycle but then at the same time how you're implicated in the same um, kind of racist structural pattern. And I wonder if you want to talk more about that. Yeah, I mean, there's kind of a lot to talk about, but one of the things I felt like I needed to address was not only that, um, you know, being in a majority black city um, is sort of one um, way that race came into sort of my, my purview. Um, but but being a, a white person in a Bengali community was another like very had, had very real effects because there's a lot of anti-blackness in the Bengali community, and then there's a lot of um, uh, sort of support and you know maybe not uncritical welcoming of white folks, and I mean I loved, love, and will always love into the future, my neighbors. But, um, but there were moments where it was clear that I was being read as a person who was white and not as Anne the neighbor. And, um, you know, of course, like this has happened to me. I spent seven years traveling around Cambodia. I've lived in the world. I've been in Chicago and Seattle, which both have really, you know, interesting, complicated racial demographics. I was born in South Dakota. But um, something about the way that I was placed in a racial construct as a white person was really, really more profound than I had experienced that anywhere else in the world. And I felt like I wanted to address that, um, particularly in this memoir, I've now started writing slightly more about sort of how I learn, um, how I learned what whiteness means and how, in the situation that I grew up, I grew up with a very, I mean, Matilda, I grew up in a pretty bananas family, which I'm sure you can relate to, um, but, my father was um, pretty racist and his mother, it turns out, was likely problematically racist. And the way that you learn racial identity, I think, in those moments, 
um, I feel like it would be great if we could dig that up culturally and we can start thinking about like, not just thinking about what blackness means or what whiteness means, but like, how did you learn what blackness means or what whiteness means? And I feel like I started to do that a little bit in this book and, and, and that's a lot of what, um, what the book is about is coming to terms with what, what it means, you know, not just in interactions with my neighborhood, but to be given a house as a, a white person um, that was taken from a black woman. Yeah, you know, that, that is structural white supremacy at its finest. And that's, well, you know, you gotta talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you do such a great job at showing all those layers. Um, you know, in particular, the, you know, in some, I feel like uh, narratives about gentrification, you know, where, um, which are very true in many ways, like white people moving to neighborhoods and gentrifying them and not being welcomed by the neighborhood, but existing separately. Now in this narrative, you are wholeheartedly welcomed by the neighborhood. And what you're saying in a certain sense is the whiteness is the status that the neighborhood wants access to, right? And the way that some of your neighborhoods talk, you know, in racist ways about black people because they're assuming your um, sort of complicity in that same structure. And then, but then at the same time, what's also really interesting is there are all these moments also where they see, you know, things that you've, um, brought back with you from Cambodia that you're putting up in your house. And they're also, they're like, oh, are you Bengali? <laughs> like each time. And so there's also this really interesting way. I think that you denaturalize race at the same time as showing how racism and white supremacy work. Um, and I wonder if you want to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, thank you for saying that. That is um, really, kind. I do, I mean, I think, I don't, you know, I don't think that my neighbors always saw me exclusively as a white person, that they had the potential to, to, to gain from. Um, in fact, I think actually that my closest neighbors, the people that sort of get the most screen time in the book, um, really just were like, whatever, there's a girl in the neighborhood and let's like hang out with her, you know? They, and I fell in love with them pretty quickly and I think that that, that relationship was totally genuine um, and continues to be genuine to this day. Um, but, I, but I do think that, um, there, that there were moments where it was clear that that, that was not um, a universal sense. Now I've totally forgotten the question, where were we? <laughs> well, I was interested in the way that you're denaturalizing race mm. at the same time as exposing racism. But I think that's part of it in a sense, because yeah. the neighbors you're talking about are kids, right? Girls. And, um, and so they have a kind of excitement that is perhaps, you know, not, has not been the clamp down, right, of adulthood has not hit in the same way. And they're also looking for ways of... Um, understanding and expressing and connecting with their world that I think you do offer them as someone coming from outside. Yeah, I mean, some of it's about uh, racial identity and some of it's just about like cultural identity and some of it's about like internationalism and some of it's about just like being a, a feminist and trying to navigate the world as a, a single woman who you know, appears significantly younger than she is. And, and so like, did kind of seamlessly fit into a couple of teenagers that hung around the neighborhood all the time. Um, at least in my mind, maybe that's totally not true. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, through all those things, all those things are also the lenses through which we experience race. And so the denaturalization of it kind of happens I think by examining all the factors that go into those decisions. And, you know, there is a sense that um, 
there there is there is a, a thing about race that that Daphne is bringing up in the chat actually that um, that there was also this thing where you know in a city that's as absolutely overwhelmingly oppressive to its residents as Detroit is it doesn't matter if you're white or you're black it doesn't it it really only matters if you live in a certain neighborhood and you have a certain income and you hang out with certain people who are usually construction workers who are therefore the richest people in town like I couldn't get home insurance because I was redlined out of it because I lived in a majority Bengali community I couldn't get internet I couldn't you know, there was no sense that I could get a working water or clean water. Um, and nobody else in the city really can either. And that's, you know, um, that's a bigger issue than race. That's just flat out like trying to squelch citizens. Yeah, and I think there's also this question of belonging that I think yeah. in some ways is as central certainly to the book um, as gentrification, at least in my reading of it. <laughs> um, and I, I love this line you have in the book where you say community is the people who show up, invited or not, desirable or not, it can only be defined as the folks who spend time with you. And so in some ways you do find that, right? But then in other ways, um, it's never quite there and I, I was also quite you know because I feel like you find that in a sense among your neighbors um, mm -hmm. and also among people you meet in Detroit but then there's this really interesting part where you talk about how the uh, the lore of the nuclear family um, in Detroit is so central in all of these different realms right in a countercultural realms in like you know, uh, and in the realm of this um, Bengali neighborhood that you're living in. And I wonder if you want to talk about that sort of, that sense of what community is, the people who show up and where that is and where um, it doesn't exist and where eventually I feel like you leave because of that, correct? In some ways. Yeah, I mean, I, and the, you know, so much happened in my life that the book kind of constructs a narrative that obviously doesn't tell the whole story. And, and also like, there's like two years of bananas stuff happening that not a word of which appears in the book that was happening at the same time. And so, um, so, I, so there's a couple of things that I never really ended up feeling clean about, like that I had really gotten my head around. And one of them is this notion of home. And the other is this, the opposite of it, which is like, what, what specifically can I say that is true about why I left Detroit besides like, it just was too much, it was too much. And because it is true that I, you know, really did end up finding people that I loved more dearly than I have ever loved anyone. But I also, you know, wasn't as a writer feeling challenged or accepted or engaged or welcomed and that it turns out is so central to my notion of home that I I think that I left looking for that in particular and that's like you know that's like a like a professionalism question that's like a career question and like I'm someone who's like super like professionally driven and or you know professionally slash artistically however we want to define it um, and so that for me is, is far more significant than it would be, I think, for a lot of normal people um, or healthy people maybe. Um, but it was important enough that I, you know, I just couldn't see being there forever because I was never going to feel fulfilled in this intellectual part of my life. It was so, it's so important to me. But the, the question about community is really like, I don't know, I was kind of wondering how you felt about that, Matilda, because it, you know, that's a driving force in the freezer door as well, is how do we, how do we engage with others? What do we require and how do we find it? Yeah, um, well, I guess, yeah, I mean, for me, I think the question in the freezer door is, 
this dream of the city as the place where you find everything um, that you never imagined. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a dream that I hold on to, right? That when I go outside, I will be changed by interactions that I have in public. And that that density of experience, that openness um, will hold me and that I will find that kind of connection out in the world, right? That's why I live in cities. And, but of course, in our gentrified cities, and especially in Seattle, where the book takes place, um, that possibility is foreclosed, you know, by gentrification, by assimilation, by commodification, by technology, and by this moment that we're living in now. And mm -hmm. so I'm constantly pushing against that to try to find what I need anyway. And um, so in a way, the book is kind of circling around those moments. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's interesting because, you know, I lived in Baltimore about uh, three years ago for, no, four, three years ago, yeah, doing research for the next book I'm writing. Now, Baltimore has a lot of similarities to Detroit. Um, you know, it's another large industrial city that has been destroyed by, you know, racist disinvestment and, um, you know, structural um, neglect, right, at a systemic level. And so on the street, the way people interacted was great. It was exact, I mean, it was just very direct, right? It was like people either yelled at me or they wanted to talk to me. They were, you know, they would threaten me, They but, but they would also, you know, um, you know, ask me if I wanted to go out. Do you want to go out? You know, like, and that doesn't happen. That happens so rarely in Seattle. So I loved yeah. that part of it, right? But at the same time, there was, and I don't know if this is similar to Detroit, but it was very, um, like, it was like, if I had actually, I knew I was leaving, you know, I moved there for seven months, eight months, and, which is kind of a long time to, but I knew I was leaving, right? So, mm -hmm. and so did everyone else. So it was like, if I was involved in a very deeply in a project, I felt like I could have a sense of place, but it wasn't, um, it was, yeah. So I guess the question is that I asked myself is like, and I still am asking this, right? This dream of the city, which for me is that dream of connection, right? That mm -hmm. dream of openness, that dream of uh, desire, opening up possibilities in the world and that dream of a world without walls, wh whether that's possible anymore. Um, but I, I feel like it actually connects to some questions we're getting. So I wanna ask this question for you um, about modernism, uh, where you write about Virginia Woolf thinking about thinking. And then this is a quote from you, it can be a lot to constantly position oneself before presenting one's views to remain vigilant against claims of authority, there are those who cling to the authority modernism allows for the hierarchies it creates. Oh wait, that's not a question. Okay, um, let's see. There, okay, yeah, the question is, do you wanna chat more about modernism? But maybe we can connect this because I was thinking in the momentarily, I was thinking this connected, yeah. but yeah. So this question about modernism um, as a place of possibility, um, but also as a place that reimposes hierarchies. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that that those things are very connected. I mean, the the design of the the best design that capitalism came up with to sort of achieve its end was modernism, you know. And like, so there's all these ways that actually like this design aesthetic that we um, that's so clean and so like, you know identifiable and it feels so you know open and modern and futury and it's really like um you know marketable and sort of easy to digest um is is uh you know tied in so many ways to a fundamentally like commercial but also really damaging you know misogynistic and transphobic and profit-minded culture and for me, that became very 
inextricably linked not only to Detroit, where which is the sort of closest big city to where modernism emerged in, I think Grand Rapids was the sort of very birthplace of modernism, but to cities in general, because of course we have the grid that Virginia Woolf does write about and, and how, um, you know, she's writing about London, but she's writing about, uh, we were all being slung back and forth on this grid to create some pattern. Um, and she's writing about the city, but she's also envisioning a, a, a sort of clear, like modernist style like painting almost. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think I just, I just got turned off by all of them at exactly the same moment. And so when I picked up and left and I, I went back to Chicago for a little while, but you know, I, I was also done with Chicago and I moved to a town of less than 500 people and I live in the mountains and the, it's completely bananas here. I um, am mostly surrounded by farmers every day. I happen to live in a little town that has, it's not even a town, it's a village. It has seven independent bookstores and the largest oxycodone manufacturing facility in the world. And we abolished the police like 10 years ago. And it's totally weird and it's totally backwards in all of these ways. And like the reason that people abolish the police has nothing to do with like being secret anarchists, but is actually just about like, we didn't really have the money anymore. and There wasn't a budget to pay them anymore. And so we didn't really need them because like Joe is a retired law enforcement agent. And so for me, like, escaping modernism, escaping cities, and like allowing myself to rethink different ways of engaging with the world, we're all part of the same project. Oh, that's so interesting too, because you left looking for connection um, with other writers and artists. And in order to find that you've moved to a city or a town, not even a town, but a village. Um, that is outside, way more outside of all of that, although I guess closer perhaps to New York. Um, but and it happens to have a really large thriving community of writers. Okay, and is that- like, I didn't know that, that before. seven bookstores? <laughs> no, totally unrelated. No, the bookstores are like a tourist trap. But like I, I locked into this situation where I was like, oh, actually somehow, you know, these things that I thought that I wanted actually turn out to be in this little teeny little village in the middle of these mountains. And what is this village called, by the way? Uh, it's called Hobart. Hobart, that's it. Yeah. Oh wait, is that where Hobart Press is? Hobart Pulp? No. No, no okay. Not related no. at all, okay. Now there's, there's nothing like that here, no. Just <laughs> ox, all the oxycodone you've ever seen in your life that comes from here. And is that, does everyone just get high on oxycodone and, and read books? <laughs> I mean, probably. <laughs> it's not what That's I do, amazing. but I'm sure that that happens a lot, yeah. Well, I see another comment, which is, uh, I'm not sure if it's a question, but let's see. Being kicked out of the public meeting because of your profession, it felt like I was kicked in the gut, feeling the pain of your attempt to represent Nishat and Sadia and their families, and it felt like everything were powerless to change. So, and then, yeah, that, yeah so that, that's the question. <laughs> yeah. Do you have anything to respond to that? Well, yeah. I mean, it's, in some ways it gets at this like question of feeling isolated and this sense of like a lack of connection to a community. But in other ways, it's also just how oppression works, that it, it finds ways of shutting down connections between people. And, you know, one thing that the city of Detroit really was effective at doing is, is sort of um, trying to, you know, like in addition to like not really teaching people to read and not valuing um, reading spaces or um, education, but it also 
you know, doesn't really foster a thriving free press. And, and what that means if you're a journalist is that like people are really suspicious of you and they think that you're probably not going to represent them fairly. And that to me is, you know, you saw, I saw that in Cambodia a lot where I lived for about, you know, on and off for about seven years before I moved to Detroit. And it's, it is something that happens under, you know, pretty awful um, dictatorial regimes where anybody who asks questions or tries to, you know, tell a version of the story that is not the official version that is coming from the highest government seat in the office is viewed with suspicion and shut down as soon as possible. And the fact that this was coming from other residents in Detroit um, didn't surprise me at all, but it did bum me out really, really thoroughly. And it wasn't, you know, that was sort of the one story of that that I told, but, but that happened on a pretty consistent basis. Um, the comics journalism project that I was doing with, with Melissa Mendes, you know, half the people that I spoke to didn't want to speak to me because, uh, because I was a journalist. And the other half only wanted to speak to me because they thought that I would agree to go on a date with them. And it was really like eye-opening um, in a bad way <laughs> of like, oh, this is how I'm perceived in the world. And this is the, the good that I can have in the world is like, I can sleep with that guy. And that's my option. I wonder if you also want to talk about um, your existence in Detroit queerness and how you are not necessarily um, read as queer in all these different situations. That's one example. Um, also in your neighborhood. Um, also, uh, and, and, but at the same time, this kind of search for, I think, I guess I would also talk about or ask the question about disability at the same time yeah. and chronic health struggles, like searching for a place for your body um, where you can feel alive in all of your complications and possibilities and what having that house in that short time did and did not allow for you. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the book is really visceral. Like I, tr I try to write really from the body and about the body a lot. And so a lot of those things, I feel like I tried to work into the way that I wrote the book and not necessarily address as text. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't read as queer by the, the people that were my age in my neighborhood. Um, there is a kind of a nice queer scene in Detroit. Um, it's small. Um, and, uh, but like super interesting and welcoming. Um, but, you know, the people that were my age in my neighborhood, that wasn't something that they were either interested in or terribly conversant in. Um, and it took, you know, the, the young women, Nisha and Sadia, a little bit of time to catch on. But once they caught on, they were just like, oh my gosh, you know, like, hooray for being queer. Like, that's so great. And uh, did you know, like, and can we talk about bisexuals today? Or like, let's, you know, give us, give us the hint on what a trans person is. And, and it was just really like welcoming to have this like youthful, exuberant enthusiasm about this, this thing that for most of my days was kept very, very, um, you know, it, it wasn't acknowledged in the world. I think I talk a little bit about going to visit a therapist who handed me a form on my way in, like the intake form was like, check off your sexuality and check off your, it wasn't even check off your gender identity. It was check off your, um, your pronouns. Um, and there were three options. And then um, check off your sexuality. And there were four options or five options maybe. And one of them was queer. And so I checked queer. And she, when she got it, she was like, what does this mean? Like, what is qu queer? What am I supposed to do with that? Uh -huh. And I was like, 
it was one of the options on your form. It's the one that describes me. Like, what do you, what do you want me to say? And she was like, well, do you sleep with men or women? And I was like, I sleep with whoever I want to. And like, you're a therapist. You're supposed to not be judging me for this. And she was like, well, I'll just write women. And I was like, well, that's not what I said, but like, okay, I guess that's the, li the limits of your imagination are now dictating the way that I can have this conversation with you. And that again, like, like being kicked out of an event for being a journalist, it, I just felt like I was constantly being limited by like what other people had expected or allowed me in, in their imaginary realm to, to be able to do. And it just was, you know, continually frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems key, the limits of the imagination. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, and that, well, I want to just encourage, if anyone has any last minute questions, we have a few more minutes, uh, feel free to throw them in there. Um, but yeah, the limits of the imagination, that, that really is a through line in both of our work. <laughs> yeah. And lives. <laughs> um, and I think also this question about being, um, you know, we're both uh, 26, right? So, um, <laughs> I'm about to turn uh, so being, in your, being in your 40s um, and still being countercultural and thinking outside of mainstream ideas of connection and um, art making and living and dreaming, um, I feel like, and having that pulse, right? That's the pulse like you said, it's not necessarily the um, directly what you're writing about, but it is a current underneath, right? And that is part of that like search for connection or search for a place where the limitations of the imagination no longer exist, right? Yeah. Um, and I wonder, do you see that? This is a big question, <laughs> but do you see that as the point of writing. Is to expand the limits of, of the imagination that are being presented. Or to find a place where the limits no longer exist. Mm. Well, one thing, one thing I wanna, I wanna answer that question in, in this way. Um, I think the more that I realize that how severely imaginations were limited in Detroit and how it was affecting me, the more I realized how severely they were affecting the young women in my neighborhood. And when I realized that we had that structure in common, even though it was about entirely different things, right? Their futures were being limited um, and their educations were being limited. Whereas my like ability to move around the city was being limited and my ability to get my job done. So, so those looked like different things, but it was the same problem. And so I think that writing the book in a way was about writing through that, both for, from my perspective and to, as much as I could distill it from their perspective as well. Do I think that that is the project of writing in general? I mean, I would like it to be. I think that my writing tends to come initially out of a place. I always feel like I start a writing project because someone has enclosed me in a paper bag and, and balled it up fairly tightly and I need to find a way to get out of it. and. And so maybe that eventually becomes about finding a way to like free myself from these limitations of imagination. But it also feels really physical in a way. It doesn't exclusively feel about mind expansiveness. And I think that's kind of what my critique of modernism is about is that for me, a lot of these things are very much about you know, limitations on my physical abilities, my actual, you know, physical disabilities, my chronic illness, my ability to operate as a queer woman in the world and, and like hang out with and smooch on whoever I feel like. 
Um, and those, and because I write so viscerally, or I try to write so viscerally, it also feels like a project of physical expansiveness as well as intellectual expansiveness. Mm. Yeah, I feel that so deeply, actually. You know, mm. um, everything you're saying about the limitations of Detroit, which are entirely different than the limitations of, of Seattle, but I feel all of it. <laughs> and <laughs> was the reason for writing the freezer door to figure out a way that my body might have a home. Um, yeah. I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, maybe we never do. <laughs> um, but I'm glad you have a good place in Hobart at the moment. And I want to encourage everyone to get Anne's book, Gentrifier, from third place books tonight. Hey, that's what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> oh, that's what you're supposed to say. Well, here's Spencer. Welcome back, Spencer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what are you doing? Sealing my lines. Um, no, I, uh, I just want to thank you both. Uh, first of all, Matilda and Anne. This was, I mean, this is the reason I stay up, stay up late on a Friday night is to listen to conversations like this. And I really appreciate the both of you. Uh, doing this. Um, to everyone who's listening, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, uh, just like Matilda was saying, uh, go buy a copy of Anne's book at gentrifier at thirdplacebooks.com or you can swing by any one of our stores. Um, we have three locations in Seattle at Lake Forest Park, uh, the Ravenna neighborhood, and the Seward Park neighborhood. Um, do you have any final thoughts before we close out the evening? Uh, oh, I do. I got this at Indian Vintage. Uh, Indian Summer Vintage in Seattle. My stylist, oh, really? <laughs> Adria, hooked me up with it. And um, if you're in Seattle, you should go. That's it. That's okay. Okay. Four, blocks down the, four blocks down the hill from my apartment. <laughs> oh, go say hi to Adria for me. <laughs> well, wonderful. Thank you both again. And again, thank you to everyone who's listening tonight. And uh, have a wonderful weekend. And please be well. That was fantastic. Thank, thank you. you all. Mm-hmm. <laughs>